Hey guys, my name is Gene. I am a uh, corporate pilot. I'm a captain on the Pilatus PC-12 uh, Legacy and NG models. And I'm here in the uh, Caronado X-Plane 11 PC-12 uh, Legacy. It looks like a Series 10. And I uh, thought I would do a video uh, exploring the differences between the simulated model here and the real airplane. And it looks uh, honestly pretty good at first glance. And uh, full disclosure, I haven't really flown this yet. I do have the Reality Expansion Pack installed. Uh, I am pretty much brand new to X-Plane 11 and uh, the Coronado PC-12 here, so uh, we will be going through this for pretty much the first time seriously that I've actually looked at this thing together. And uh, I am not much of a uh, home sim pilot, but I do have the Honeycomb uh, yoke. I've got the uh, just some CH rudder pedals and the SciTech throttle quadrant that I'm using today. And I think I've got everything configured here to be able to do this. So let's get going on the comparison and see how this thing stacks up to the real airplane. So I've got the airplane cold and dark here. I'm on the ramp, <coughs> excuse me, in Orcas Island, Washington. And uh, we're just out here on the south end of the airport, our nice white PC-12 here as you can see and uh, if anybody knows in the comments how to uh, speed up this view like when you're panning around to look around tell me how to speed this up because it is like agonizingly slow but anyway so I've got the airplane cold and dark and uh, for the purposes of this flight I actually don't have the checklists in front of me so I'm going to try to do things by flow memory and uh, slow it down a little bit just for comparison purposes between the real airplane and the simulated airplane so this isn't going to be exactly the way I would do it in real life, but I'm going to try to do it pretty close to how I would do it in real life. So, um, At this point, we would assume that we've got the passengers loaded up, the bags are in, the doors are closed, we pulled the chocks out. Speaking of which, let's make sure the parking brake's set. So in the real airplane, you have to prime the brakes first, which means you're going to apply pressure to the brakes and then pull this. And let's see, I actually need to get my rudder pedals in front of me. And I'm not sure how to actually click on this thing. All right, let's see how this works. So it looks like the pedals are moving. That's good. Okay, so it was already set. So we've got the brakes pressed right now, and it won't let me actually pull it. So I assume I have to let go. Yeah, so that's not realistic. So in the real airplane, if you uh, if you did not prime the brakes and you pulled this lever like I just did, you would not actually have any brake pressure stored, and the airplane would, even though the handles pulled, would be able to roll. So that's a little uh, a little bit on the unrealistic side, but that's all right. We can hide the yoke. The yoke actually looks pretty darn good. It looks almost exactly like the real thing, but I'm going to hide that so we can see what we're doing a little better here. And let's see, everything looks pretty good. So I'll just start with the receiving flow. And if you don't know what a receiving flow is, I would have um, probably already done this before I had loaded in the passengers. But receiving flow is done when you first uh, take the airplane for the day, you get in, you make sure all the switches are in the right position. So we'll, we'll do that. We'll start over here with the left-hand circuit breaker panel. Looks like everything's in. <clears throat> I'm going to pan over here and we'll look at the right-hand circuit breaker panel or what we can see of it there. Those look like they're all in. And I assume, yeah, these probably aren't modeled to actually be pullable or anything. And we'll come back here and check our passenger oxygen switch. And that is actually turned off, so I would need to turn that on to, I'd put that on auto now if we had passengers in the back. And it looks like this isn't actually modeled to work. So that would go in the center position uh, in the real airplane. And come across here and make sure my mic switch is on mic, not mask. That's good got our handheld mic here just like in the roller plane ELT is armed that's how we want it and we're gonna move up here to the overhead panel <clears throat> get our shade out of the way so uh, we don't have the GPU hooked up so I'm gonna go ahead and turn on the battery here and uh, it looks like we've got the nav lights on that is good we would want those on in the real airplane and at this point I would uh, test our lamps so let's see if we can yeah we can at least test the overhead panel here it looks like every light is working there and then I'm not sure how to hold that in and so of course in the roller plane I would press and hold that button and I would look down here to make sure all these lights lit up 
where there are some, but I don't know how to do that in the sim without <clears throat> um, just, you know, I can't click and look away. There's probably a way, but I don't know how to do it. If there is, let me know in the comments. And then I'll also check our fire warning. Fire. Fire. So we have the oral warning working, and then our master caution and warning would actually light up the roller plane, and that didn't happen here. So that's a little on the unrealistic side, but that's okay. I also noticed it looked like those were flashing. So let me come up here and hit the lamp test again. Okay, it didn't work. But anyway, I think uh, these were flashing. So in the uh, in the roller plane, the master caution and warnings do not flash when they come on. They're just steady. We'll check our uh, fuel pumps. So you can hear the left fuel pump on, and we should have a left fuel pump light. It looks like the other one was on too, which it shouldn't be, but we do have the sound of both working. So on the cause, yeah, well, we had the we had both of them come on when I just hit the left-hand fuel pump. I'm not sure why that happened. So you can see they both came on. Anyway, they would, those would go on one at a time. Fuel pumps are working, and our ignition's in auto. That's how we want it. Looks like we've got 14 volts on the uh, battery there. And we actually don't want our avionics on. That's a little weird that those were turned on. So this isn't uh, this isn't quite realistic in the, in the roller airplane. You'd have more than this up. The EIS is up, which is good. Yeah, there they are. They're flashing. So these don't actually flash on the roller airplane. Uh, <coughs> but uh, at any rate, back up to the overhead panel. Uh, the generator should be in the opposition. They are bat tube. We're going to leave off. I guess I can turn that on now, just for the sake of doing this. And we've got pretty low voltage here, 23.4 volts on both. Uh, so in real life, we actually could not start the engine on 24 uh, less than 24 volts. So in this case, we would need to get the GPU over here and hook up. But hey, it's a sim, so we're going to do it anyway. And uh, let's see, over here, we've got Gen 2 is off, Avionics 1 and 2 buses are off, the non-essential override is in auto, that's how we want it. We're going to switch to the other inverter, and the standby bus switch, and yeah, that's weird, we don't want that on. And that's, that doesn't appear to be working, so when you, uh, when you flip the standby bus on, you should see a blue on uh, light here in this little window that would light up, so that doesn't appear to be modeled for some reason. I'm a little surprised by that, but uh, that is okay. Anyway, moving right along. Up here we're going to check our de-ice panel. <coughs> everything should be off on the ground, of course, and it looks like everything is. The only thing we want on or open is the inertial separator. Oh, what is that? What is the clicking? guessing that that's probably the sound effect for it opening. It does not make that sound in the roller plane. You won't hear a, a thing. But uh, we do want the inertial separator open for any operations on the ground and then uh, low altitude in flight as well. And uh, let's see. So we've got our... What in the heck is all this clicking, guys? Good lord. Let's look outside and see if we can see it opening. Oh, you can hear the clicking outside too. Okay, there it stopped. I don't... Uh, no, I don't really see it open, but... Uh, that's okay. I guess it's uh, I guess it's in the open position now. That's where we want it. And uh, let's see, back up here. <coughs> um, probe heats off, windshield heats off. That's good. We can turn on our passenger signs. Uh, they do not chime like that in the real airplane. There's no sound associated with that. And our cooling and heating systems are in the off position, which is good. And of course, our uh, master power switch is on and guarded. Otherwise, we wouldn't be seeing any of this. And these batteries are draining very fast. This is not realistic. We're already down to 23 volts. Uh, in the real airplane, you could have uh, this stuff up and running, and you wouldn't really see a significant drop in voltage for a little while. Uh, anyway, so moving back down here, hopefully we don't run our batteries bone dry while we're talking here. So we're going to check our EIS. And here I would hit the test button. And that is not uh, how it works in the real airplane at all. So uh, you wouldn't get any master caution warning, anything on the cause when you hit that button. Uh, all that this does is display what we call eights and tapes, which means uh, all of these uh, LCD bars, these segments around the uh, engine instruments will extend all the way up to their maximum positions and then back down. And uh, all of the numerical digits on the display will display eights. So it's basically showing you that the display is working and nothing is 
burned out or malfunctioning. Uh, but it didn't do any of that, and it gave us all kinds of other lights. This is more of a lamp test down here. Uh, you can see you can check all your cause lights there and everything, uh, but that is not how it works in the real airplane. Uh, anyway, and then we would also reset our fuel here, so I would have to hold this button down for a few seconds, which I'm doing now, and I'm not seeing anything change. And our quantity would update, and it, typically it'll update, you know, it would be a few pounds different uh, when the sensors get a new reading. And I didn't see that happen there, so maybe that's not modeled. Uh, let's see, moving right along. Our EFIS, we went on norm. We would check our EPS system here, so I'm going to hold this down, and that green light should come on for five seconds, so count to five, that's good, then we would arm that, and I can't tell if the sun is just shining on that orange light or if it's on, but it would actually be on in the real airplane if this is modeled correctly, and then our AHARS 1 and 2 should be on slave, they're both on slave, that's good, gear is down three green, and uh, cause we would just give a quick look at these lights, of course we already tested to make sure they all work and just make sure nothing is abnormal here. So gen, uh, both gens are off, avionics buses, the stab trim, inverter, fuel pressure, hide light, and the non-essential bus, that's all normal stuff. And uh, we would turn our oxygen on. And a little bit of a weird sound there. So in the, in the real airplane, when you turn this lever on, you'll hear a, a discharge of oxygen. It's actually pretty loud in the cockpit that comes out of the masks. Um, and uh, I didn't hear it there. But anyway, oxygen is on. We're going to turn our ECS to off, which means, oh, the last guy didn't do his job. That should be off when you get in the airplane. Cabin pressurization uh, is in auto. That's where we want it. And uh, we'd set our temperature here for something comfortable, depending on the outside conditions. And our pressurization controller, let's assume that uh, today we're going to go up to maybe flight level 220, and it's basically already set, so I'd set that to 225 on that inside scale. And uh, this is our cabin rate knob right here, and this is actually, this should be at about the 12 o'clock position, uh, which is, which will give you about five or 700 feet per minute rate of climb or descent uh, as you're pressurizing or changing altitudes, but I'm not sure why it was all the way down, but uh, we'll see what happens when we get in the air if that's working correctly. All right, and uh, let's see up here. We can't check our audio panel because we don't have any power to it yet. Uh, transponders, same deal. Of course, the, we've got looks like dual 530s in this thing, and those are off. And then on the other side, since we're flying single pilot today, I'm not going to worry about the mic or mask switch over there. And uh, that's everything. And then down here, too, on the on the center pedestal, a couple things we're going to check. Um, it's going to be a little hard to see back here. I'm not sure how to move my viewpoint back here to where I can see stuff, but uh, here are our trim indicators. And we would actually, let me see if, oh, wow, okay. I was going to say that didn't look like it was working, but, huh, this is reversed. So you got aileron trim, rudder trim here, and then this is your stab trim. The stabilizer, the horizontal stabilizer actually is trimmable on the PC-12. And I'm using my yoke to make inputs on that, and they're actually reversed from what they should be. So when I pull the switch down, this should go up and it goes down. So that's actually, it's actually uh, reversed. But anyway, so you got two marks on there. You've got two green marks. Uh, the, this, the top one there is just for normal takeoff trim. And uh, this is what we call the diamond. The little green diamond there is uh, for if the uh, CG is aft of 236 inches. So if you have a lot of weight in the back, uh, you would actually adjust your trim to that diamond. But uh, we do not today, so we're going to put it on the normal tab. And our trim and our flap interrupts are in norm and guarded. That's how they should be. Our flaps are up. Our PCL, let's see if that works. Yep. Okay, that's in idle. Our moor is idle and stowed. Our condition lever, it looks like back there, is in feather cutoff like it should be, and all of our interior lights are turned off. And then down here on the center pedestal behind, you can't see, but there's the manual gear extension lever, and then you've got ECS, you've got a couple of fuel and ECS firewall cutoffs, and those paddles should be in, it looks like they, they are, because if they were out, we would see them from here. Uh, they kind of hang out. So anyway, uh, looks like those are all set how we want them. And that means uh, our receiving flow is complete, so in real life I would back that up now with the checklist, but since we're not using the actual checklist today, we'll just move right on to a before start flow. So. 
first thing before start flow is uh, again we want to check our battery voltage and oh my gosh we're down to 22.1 volts which is pretty crazy so uh, again not a realistic draw off those that's happening way too fast and and there is a uh, zero chance you would want to start the engine on such a low battery voltage in real life so you would need to not only get the gpu but actually let the batteries charge up before you even started the engine anyway but like i said we're in the same here so what the hey we're going to do it anyway so i'm going to turn the beacon on to let everybody know outdoors that we are about to turn the propeller and again we got the separator open and uh should be ready to go so um Usually you've got a marshaller outside. Today we, we don't, uh, so you would give them the start uh, signal to, to let them know you're about to start the engine. They would tell you you're cleared to start. Um, always check left, center. This is going to take forever because my view is moving so slowly. Center and right. Make sure that the propeller area is clear, which it is. And uh, we're ready to start. So I'm going to come up here and hold down the starter button for at least two seconds. All right, and there we go. We're checking for the prop turning. Oil pressure is rising. It is. NG rise. We're going to get that up to at least 13%, between 13 and 18, and just let it basically stabilize. Our ITT is nice and low. Okay, right about there, I'm going to introduce fuel up to ground idle, and then we're going to watch fuel flow. And the ITT looks like we have a light off. So this fuel flow would automatically go to about 80 pounds per hour um, in the... Uh, and the real airplane, so that's not quite realistic. And then we're watching the ITT and the NG rise. <clears throat> Starter should cut out automatically. It looks like it did at 50% NG, and then we should stabilize right around 63% NG. And it looks like that's about roughly what it did. ITT rolled back, it's stable. And looks like we got a good start. This fuel flow is definitely, uh, definitely far too low. Interesting. So uh, just to walk you through again what we're looking for on that start is uh, we're going to hold the starter button down for two seconds. We're going to let the starter motor engage and start to turn the engine. We're going to look outside to make sure the propeller is turning, make sure that our oil pressure, which is right down here, is alive. So it doesn't have to be in the green or anything like that. We just want to make sure that it's starting to move up. Uh, and then make sure our ITT is, is low enough, uh, below about 140, 150 degrees Celsius ITT. Of course, if it's the first start of the day, it will be, uh, but on quick turns, sometimes you have to motor the engine down to get it cooler than that before you introduce fuel, otherwise you can over-temp the engine on the start. So just to double check the ITT, is, uh, it, was, it was good, and then we're watching the NG develop, and you've got to get enough airflow on the engine before you introduce fuel, so you want to wait until you get about the maximum motor rotation, which in the, on this engine, this is the PT6A67B. And the legacy is about 13 to 18 percent NG before you introduce fuel. What you do with the fuel condition lever down here, which you can't see it right now behind the PCL, but uh, you would uh, lift this up over a gate and into the ground idle detent, and that'll introduce fuel. And when you do that, you're going to see 80 pounds per hour right here immediately as fuel is introduced into the engine to light off the engine. <clears throat> and as soon as you get the light off, you're going to watch for primarily right here on the ITT just to make sure that uh, it's, it's rising at a normal rate. It's not a runaway ITT. And that's how you're, you're watching and protecting for a hot start is watching the ITT. And also the fuel flow is going to give you a good indication too. If the fuel flow is abnormally high, then you could have a hot start as well. So, uh, And then you're also watching the NG develop. So you watch the NG for a hung start. If you, if you aren't getting good development or a rise of the NG, you could have a hung start and you're watching the ITT for a hot start. So at ground idle on this engine, the uh, NG should stabilize at about 63% NG. It can be a little higher, so this is not like that unrealistic. It wouldn't be quite that high in the real airplane, but um, this is all, these numbers look just about right. Like I said, the fuel flow is definitely way too low, so it would be about 80 pounds per hour, but, uh, but that's okay. All right, so now that we have basically dead batteries, <laughs> let's go up here and turn on some generators. So there's Gen 1, there's Gen 2. And we'll turn our avionics buses on. What's up with this standby bus? It just seems to be dead. And now we have 28 volts on the batteries. We can come down here and look at our generators. And we should have 28 volts. We do on Gen 1 and 2, so that's a good thing. And uh, set our flaps. See if I can find my button. There you go. Flaps coming down to 15. And we'll set our ECS to auto. There 
we go. Transponder should be in altitude mode. We're, we'll just imagine we're flying VFR today, so we'll leave that 1200. And let's see, we could do have a master warning here, stab trim. So that should not actually be there because the stab trim is in the takeoff range. Not sure what it wants. Let's see if we play around with it, it will go away. Yeah, it goes away on the diamond. So that's not realistic. It would actually be, uh, it would not, that uh, warning would not be displayed until we got outside of the, well outside of the takeoff range. So we're just going to have to ignore that. Which you would never ignore a warning in the real airplane, but we're going to have to do it in the sim because we got these uh, limitations we got to work with here. All right, and at this point, I would uh, again hold down the fuel reset button for two or three seconds and let that. Uh, yeah, it's not. Looks like it's not actually working, but this again would jump a few pounds. Uh, it's calibrated at 28 volts, so when you get the generators online, you want to go ahead and hit that again. And it doesn't look like it's actually modeled, but hey, we did it anyway. Clear our messages. We've got nav data that's out of date. Hey, that's okay because we're flying VFR, and hey, it's a sim anyway. Turn off our marker mute. And for some reason, it flight director is displayed up here on the uh, autopilot mode control panel, but it's not actually displayed on the EADI. So we're just going to turn that off. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. All right, let's turn on some cooling. So I'll turn the system on. Uh, we'll just turn the research on and uh, turn off that flood fan. That thing's pretty noisy and keep the fans on low. Fans are on low and that's all we need for now up there. And this is, so far I'm reasonably impressed. It's pretty, it's fairly realistic. Again, obviously some issues here and there, but overall not too bad of a, of a simulation so far here. Uh, pretty good. The transponder number two should actually be in standby. Can we do that? Okay, so they actually cross-fill, which is not realistic. So in the real airplane, these would not cross-fill, so we'll just have to turn them both to altitude and have two secondary targets on ATC radar, but that's all right. So uh, let's see what's left. So at this point, I would do an after-start uh, checklist and just to make sure I didn't miss anything, uh, and then also a before taxi flow and checklist. And uh, we would at this point tune in the ASOS or the AWOS, get the weather, uh, it's pretty much clearing a million out here today, and I, off the top of my head, I don't know the uh, AWOS frequency for Orcas Island, so we're going to skip that step. And of course, I would tune in the CTAF frequency on COM1 and set uh, the, it probably would be approach, I think, or Seattle Center, whatever, uh, ATC facility has jurisdiction over the airspace here to pick up my clearance after I departed. But again, uh, we're just messing around here, so I'm going to leave those out of there today. <coughs> Excuse me, there we go. Now we got a little bit of torque developing. And I'm going to come down here. Oops, didn't mean to click that. And set our HSI, EHSI, over to GPS. There we go. And in the real airplane, I would get my flight director configured by pressing the go around button, which it does not look like it's modeled on the PCL. So we're going to have to do some jerry rigging. So we can go into heading mode. Got the heading bug set for, I think that's roughly what the runway heading is here. We're going to depart south. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, why don't we set this to 10,000 feet or something? 10.5 since we're VFR. And uh, so normally when you hit the go around button, the command bars on the flight director will display and they will give you about a 10 to 12 degree positive pitch for your climb. But since we can't do that, I'm going to have to try something different here. So why don't we engage 10-5 and this would not light up here in the real airplane. Those actually are just buttons. They don't actually light up at all. Hey, there you go. That's a little odd. Now we have to turn our flight director on manually and if I pull this out, it'll go into vertical speed mode and I can select a vertical. There we go. Now it's coming up. So that's not, that's actually, this is pretty badly modeled, I have to say, this uh, altitude alerter. And to be fair, it's very, uh, it's, it's not very intuitive in the real airplane. It takes a little while to learn how to <laughs> work that thing and find your way around it. So I'm not, I wouldn't hold that against Coronado too much for not getting all that right because it is a little bit of a strange, strange uh, deal in the real airplane. But anyway, that flight director looks reasonably, we have a level. These, these, the symbology on the ADI is not exactly right. Uh, you would not have an altitude arm there and you would not have a level. So I'm not sure exactly why it's showing that. 
Uh, certainly would not say that in the real airplane, but uh, we're going to go with it. All right, so I think we're ready to taxi. So let me get my feet back where they need to be. And again, if you have a marshaller in real life, what you would do is uh, flash your taxi light at them, or in the daytime you can leave it on, it's not a big deal. And that lets them know that you're ready to start to taxi. Uh, but since there's nobody out there, we're still gonna clear the area. And uh, wow, this takes forever to look. Before we do that, we're gonna check our flight controls, but <laughs> it's gonna take a while to look over here. So let's check our ailerons up in a cap on this side and again I would look over I don't think I was able to see him on the other side anyway but or my co-pilot if I was flying with the crew would look over and uh, check that aileron I can see the shadow of it moving out there and those are free and correct all right so parking brakes released and we'll turn the taxi light on up here There we go, that was easy. And away we go. So I'm gonna apply some breakaway power. Check our brakes, brakes are working. Let's see if I can do beta in here. Yeah, I can, good deal. So in the real airplane, um, it, it really doesn't take much power to get it rolling at all as you're taxiing. And in fact, as you're rolling down the taxiway for most of the time, you, you uh, use beta just to keep the speed from the heck is going on here there we go well maybe that was the wrong way I'm trying to figure out how to do this with my uh, throttle quadrant because it doesn't really go <laughs> past it doesn't go very far past the idle detent there we go I think we got to figure it out now again in the real airplane you would uh, on the PCL here there are two little triggers you can't see them from this perspective but you would pull up on those to lift up over a gate uh, it's called the PCL which is the power control lever which is the big black one. And uh, when you pull aft of that gate, you go into beta, which means that the propeller pitch turns around and uh, you have basically reverse thrust. So, and uh, if you continue to pull that PCL aft, you'll eventually start to increase the speed of the engine. And then you have, instead of just beta at idle, you have reverse thrust. So as you're taxiing, you don't use reverse thrust because you can kick FOD and debris up around and ingest it into the engine and cause damage to the engine. But you do use beta all the time just to keep the speed from developing too much, which is what I'm doing now. And if I look down, maybe you can see that I'm kind of pulling it back a little bit there. Uh, the ground handling is fairly realistic so far. It uh, kind of feels like I'm taxiing the PC-12. Uh, yeah, the sounds are pretty good. The uh, I noticed on the engine start, I didn't comment at the time because we were busy doing other things. But uh, the sound on of the engine start wasn't all that great, um, especially right at the beginning of the start sequence. It's just not quite so um, I don't know noisy. Uh, it just didn't sound quite quite realistic to me. And then there was that, uh, all the clicking and stuff. Like, I guess that's supposed to maybe be the strobe, or I don't know what that's supposed to be, but that, that you don't hear that in the real airplane either. So that I wasn't too impressed with the sound effect on the engine start, but the sound effect just of idling and stuff here, the beta is actually pretty good. So we'll come down here, and uh, I'm just going to hold short down here for a minute. We already have a wing hanging over the uh, runway safety area. That's not a good thing. But uh, we're just going to come down here and pause for a minute sure we're all ready to go. Ooh, the brakes are very, very touchy. Okay, not exactly a graceful stop, but uh, there we are. So I'm going to set the parking brake. So again, in the real airplane, I would hold the brakes, but we can't do that here. So I'm going to release and pull. And since we're parked, I'm going to turn the taxi light off. All right. And so the flaps are set and they indicate 15. Uh, looks like we are nice and warm, ready to go on the engine again. The generator is both 28 volts. Fuel quantity is sufficient and balanced for the flight. Uh, in real life, we would have a, an anticipated fuel burn, and we would state that now. So let's say if we had planned in our, in our flight planning that we were going to burn 800 pounds of fuel, I would say uh, 800 required and 1332 on board. 
uh, right there in our fuel quantity, so we have sufficient fuel for sure. And uh, we would do our takeoff briefing. Even if you're flying single pilot, you'll do a, a takeoff briefing. <coughs> and uh, so we can do, you know, again, we're just kind of playing around here VFR, so it's not going to be a whole lot to say, but I would say, what is that, runway 16? Something to the effect of this would be my departure. Normal takeoff, runway 16. Uh, runway's dry, flaps 15, no crosswind. Uh, we'll fly the assigned heading up to uh, the initial altitude in this case, so we're not going to have an assigned heading, so I'll just fly the runway heading up to 10.5. Uh, weather's good. If we have to return, uh, I'll plan a visual approach back, probably left down with runway 160, and that would be a uh, probably a flap 40 landing since we don't have a lot of runway here <coughs> at Orcas Island. Excuse me. And then uh, on the uh, takeoff roll, if we have any master caution warning, any failure prior to 80 knots, we will reject the takeoff and stop on the runway. Anything after 80 knots, that will rotate. We'll treat it as an airborne emergency. If we lose power below 1,200 feet radar altitude, uh, I'm going to land straight ahead or within 30 degrees of the runway heading. And at Orcas Island here, that takes us out over the downtown and into the bay, so I think we'd probably just want to land probably into the bay if we could, if we could glide that far. And anything above 1,200 feet radar altitude, I'm going to execute a turn back to the airport here and land uh, runway 34. And uh, that's it. So then I would ask if I were flying with another crew member if they had any questions or additions or anything. And that would be the takeoff briefing complete. And again, heading back set, initial altitude is set. I think everything's ready to rock and roll. So again, we back it up with a before takeoff checklist at this point, just to make sure we didn't miss anything, but I'm satisfied. Hey, there's our little Avidyne MFD down there. Looks like not a whole lot is really modeled in this thing. The TAWS doesn't really, I don't know if the TAWS works or not, but some of the stuff's just not really modeled at all. So that looks good. Uh, kind of, except for the fixes on there don't really look that realistic, but that's okay. Oh my goodness gracious, guys, look at our trim. What is going on with our trim here? Lordy lord. Interesting. All right, well, <laughs> now the trim is set three ways. I, I didn't, uh, I certainly did not adjust that, so I'm not sure why I did it up there, but anyway. All right, uh, I think we're ready to go. So I'm going to release the parking brake. It is, and I'm turn our tax light back on. And at this point, uh, we need our landing lights. I turn the wing lights on, and also our recognition lights, which are not modeled, would be down here. We turn the recogs on to pull since it's daytime and turn our wigwag lights on. And we're going to turn on our windshield heats and our probe heats. Those are both, yeah, there we go. They should be on light. Those are both on light, and the probe heat is in the on position. And everything is set. All right. So, looks like it's clear on base and final up there. So, I'd make a call on the CTAF, of course, in real life, that we were departing runway 16, straight out departure to the south. And it's kind of a short runway, so we're going to maximize all the uh, runway ahead of us that we possibly can here. So we checked final already. Let's make sure the runway is nice and clear. Approach on that end's clear. And uh, boy, the brakes are really touchy. This is, uh, you, can, you can do this a little bit faster and more graceful in the real airplane. So. <laughs> All right, overshot just a little bit there, but uh, we're, and again, in the real airplane, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, this light at this point now that our generators are on should actually be off. So if we were on the EPS right now, that would indicate that we had an electrical problem and we certainly would not want to take off. So that's not modeled correctly. That, that should be off. It's on before the generators are online, but it should be off now. So anyway, let's bring our condition lever up to flight idle. And again, we check the cause. We should not see any lights at all, but we have the stab trim light on, which we already talked about. We're just going to have to deal with. And it looks like we're ready to go. All right. So take off. Here we go. I'm going to release the brakes, ease it up onto the governor. A little bit of right rudder. And we're going to bring it up to just about max torque. Good Lord, this is really touchy, guys. And airspeed's alive, 80 knots. We're gonna rotate. 
This feels really heavy in pitch. Positive rate. Brakes and gear coming up. Yaw damp. And the taxi and landing lights. I'm going to have to look up here and turn those off. And the wing lights. So we're pitching for about 120 knots. Let's see if I can make a little trim adjustment here. And 400 feet right around the tube, we're above that. And at least 100 knots, we're going to retract the flaps. Here they come. I'm just making a little bit of a turn out away from that high terrain over the bay here. And 1,000 feet, we're going to cruise climb and set our climb power back to 36.9 PSI on the torque or less. 150 knot cruise climb works. And our flight director is still in heading mode, so that's taking me in the right turn, but that's okay. I don't want that. Alright, so let's see if we can uh, get the autopilot set here. We got our climb power set, flaps are up, gears up. And let's see, so in the real airplane, if I pulled this knob, it would actually snap to my current heading, but it's not, it doesn't look like that feature is modeled in here. So I'm going to hit IAS for uh, indicated airspeed hold and heading mode, and let's engage our autopilot. Autopilot's engaged. So it should be banking to the right right now. There it goes. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the yacht amp in the real airplane would have that inclinometer of the ball right there centered up very nicely between those lubber lines, but it's not quite there in the sim. Okay, so at this point I would do an after takeoff checklist, pushing my PCL back up for that torque. The torque will fall as you climb, but not that fast. Back down just a scotch there. Gear is up and off, no lights. Flaps are up and indicate up. Yacht amp is engaged right there. And the lights are set. Now we need them. And we're going to make sure we're pressurizing. So I'm going to look down here. Yeah, oh wow. So this, this cabin rate of climb is like 1,500 feet per minute. So that's way too, too fast. That's actually not realistic. So with the rate knob in... Uh, Again, about the 12 o'clock position of the real airplane, you would actually get about 500 feet per minute. Here we have about 550 or 600 feet per minute. So this appears to be actually reversed from what it is in the real airplane. It's just upside down. But it uh, looks like we are pressurizing. And then in the real airplane, uh, we don't want to exceed 720 ITT in the climb, ideally. So I'm going to bring that back. And at, at this point, we do have an altitude where we cross over. We're limited at lower altitudes by torque, and then we cross over to being limited by ITT at the higher altitudes. Normally that wouldn't happen until maybe 14, 15, 16,000 feet MSL. So that's a little bit off here in the sim. And of course it depends on the outside temperature, outside air temperature, but it's not that crazy today. So that, that happened a little bit on the early side. Uh, rate of climb looks about right. Uh, it's got 1,900 feet per minute there at about 149, 148 knots. Uh, that's about right at these power settings. And uh, yeah. Like I said, we're uh, looks like we're pressurizing. Cabin altitude's climbing up to about 3,500 3, feet. That's normal for this altitude. And here are the beautiful San Juan Islands of uh, Northwest Washington State. Isn't that pretty? Very cool. So yeah, uh, control forces during the takeoff. It was much too heavy in pitch, and that might may have just been the result of the weird trim stuff going on here, but. Uh, I really had to haul back on the yoke to uh, to rotate, which isn't isn't realistic. The controls in the Legacy PC12, all the control forces and all three axes, uh, it's very heavy, but uh, it's it shouldn't have been that heavy. <laughs> so a little too heavy on that on the uh, on the pitch there. But other than that, the you know the the flight uh, modeling seems to be pretty good so far. Like I said, the rate of climb is accurate on the EIS. Things are pretty normal. I mean, it's a, honestly, it's a pretty good simulation. A um, couple issues here and there, but overall, I'm fairly impressed so far. Um, so crossing through 10,000 feet, we will, uh, after we pass 10, we'll turn off. That's one to go, 9.5, climbing 10.5. We'll turn, we'll, excuse me, close the inertial separator. Uh, each operator has its own policies on that. The operator that I uh, flew for last, the the policy was to keep the inertia separator open below 10,000 MSL just to, you know, protect us against any FOD. Um, but we're going to go ahead and close that up now. 
Oh, now it's clicking again. We got the clicking going. And then at this point, too, at pass and 10, we would turn off our recogs, but we don't have the recogs modeled in this. Uh, that clicking is so funny in this sim, anyway. So, all right, looks like it's going to capture 10 5 for us. That's a good thing. And actually, guys, we're flying southeast, so we're going to need to make a westbound turn if we're going to be at 10 5, aren't we? Let's go over to 210 heading. Oh, okay. That, again, that clicking when you're closing the separator is not realistic at all. You don't hear anything in the real airplane when you uh, when you open or close the uh, the separator like that. So that is not realistic. It is a 30 second um, cycle though, so you know that part of it was realistic. It takes th about 30 seconds to open and close. It takes quite a while. And I didn't change the, the power. Oh, okay, so your ITT and your torque will change a little bit when you close the separator, but not that much. It looks like the temperature really lowered a lot. It was like a, what was that, almost like a 35 degree drop, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't have dropped that much. <coughs> As you climb in uh, any turbine engine, with any turbine engine, you're going to see a, a, an increase in ITT and a reduction in torque. Of course, you're only going to have torque on turboprops. Um, so it's kind of like uh, flying a, an air, a piston airplane with a constant speed propeller. You're going to have to keep pushing your, your throttle in to keep your manifold pressure where you want it to be as you climb. Uh, you do have to keep pushing the PCL up as you climb in the airplane to keep the torque where you want it until you max out on your ITT, and then you would have to actually start to pull the PCL back to ride that ITT up to your, your cruise altitude where you level off. And then, of, of course, as you descend, it's it's all reversed. So, And it looks like that that is modeled in here, and I was pretty happy to see that the torque and the ITT were behaving pretty much as they would in real life. I think they were, the rate of change is a little bit too fast, but uh, at, least, at least they're trying. So, yeah, anyway... Um, why don't we? Uh, I'm not. I'm not actually probably going to turn around and try to uh, fit the whole approach and landing in on this video because uh, if I haven't bored you completely to death yet, I feel like that probably would do it. <laughs> so, uh, if you're still here at this point, thank you so much for sticking around. Uh, by the way, one note before I wrap this up on cruise power setting is uh, 685 ITT is uh, is a pretty good rule of thumb for really any altitude in the airplane if you. There we go. I'm just bumping the PCL up a scotch here <coughs> to get us to 680, 685-ish ITT. Uh, that's a good rule of thumb. At any altitude in the airplane, you're really taking care of the engine. Uh, you can, of course, look up the torque power settings for your cruising altitude and, and uh, temperature in the AFM. Uh, but if you set that torque, you're typically going to end up at about 685 ITT anyway. So really, it's kind of a useful trick or tip in the airplane is if you just set 685 ITT for cruise power, your, your torque's going to end up being where it needs to, to be for the POH anyway. So, um, anyway, one note on the cruise power settings there for you. Okay, well, that's it for now, guys. I will probably do a part two to this video. Uh, please, please, please let me know in the comments if you have any questions about anything I said or if I screwed something up uh, or if you just want me to explain something more. Please don't hesitate to let me know. I love. Uh, interacting with people in the comments and thanks for watching if you don't mind hit that like button that would help me out a lot and subscribe and uh, i will hope to see you guys back for another video another part two and just more videos about the pc12 thanks guys